Good morning. My name's Ben. If I haven't met you, I'd love the chance to meet you before you leave today. Um, I want to do something this morning. I want to give you a couple minutes to pray. Uh, and just, so, just a few minutes to silently pray. And, um, and the goal is that whatever you brought in this morning, you would leave it at Jesus' feet. That whatever distractions, maybe you got something going on at home. Um, maybe in your marriage, or maybe with your kids, or, or, or maybe there's something going on at work. Um, maybe you just had a, a hectic morning, and you've been here, and you've been singing the songs, but you haven't really focused yet. And I just want to give you a chance to do that. I want to, I want to give you a chance to kind of settle your heart um, before the Lord and leave anything at, at His feet that might distract you, that might get in the way of you just receiving uh, from the Lord this morning and hearing what He might want to say to you. Um, so, so let's do that right now. Let's pray together. Lord, it's so good to be in your presence this morning with your people, singing your praises. Right now, we just lay at your feet whatever things are worrying us. Lord, whatever things are distracting us, keeping us from being present here in this moment with you and with your people. Lord, we lay at your feet the things that are keeping us up at night, the, the sins that are um, tripping us up, the shame, Lord, that those sins bring. We, we lay at your feet our, our doubts and our, um, our unbelief, our fear, maybe even, this morning about just being in church. Um, and we come to you believing that you are good and that your word is true and asking that you would meet us, that you would minister to us through your word, by your Holy Spirit, and that you would say what needs to be said and that you would give us the ears to hear what we need to hear and good hearts to receive it and to go away and do something about it. Live differently because of it. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So um, if you've been around for a little while, you know I like to use uh, sermon illustrations from my days as a firefighter. I don't know why that is, except that I just uh, have a lot of illustrations that, uh, that came from that. So, um, so before I was a pastor, I was a firefighter, and um, there, there was about a nine-month-long uh, training that we went through called the Fire Academy, and during that time, we did some crazy things, some strange things that, that were mostly geared towards teaching us to... Uh, to have a presence of mind in the middle of a chaotic, uh, kind of scary thing going into a burning house, a b burning building, and, um, and and teaching you how to uh, how to how to react, how to keep a clear head, and that kind of thing. One of the one of the little drills that we did that was interesting that always stuck with me was uh, we had a tower that that we trained in was one of the buildings that we trained in, and it was a four-story tower. And um, 
they, they put you in, in full gear and, uh, and you know, you have glo thick gloves and, and all this heavy stuff, about 80 pounds worth of gear. And, they, and the fire hood, the thing that goes over your head before your helmet, um, they would turn it around backwards so it was covering your mask. So you couldn't see. Most every drill that we did, you, you do blind because you can't see in a fire. I don't know if you know that. It's not like in the movies. Uh, it's not like there's a little fire every, everywhere and you can just see and run around. It's totally black, pitch black, can't see. So you do your drills like that. So they put us in the top of this building, climb up to the top on the roof, and they turn this thing around and they say, all right, on, on the floors below you, the four floors below you, there is one bolt, and one, one nut, and you got to find both. And you got to put them together. And you got to come out the bottom floor, and you got to hand me that nut and that bolt. Um, and on those floors, there's going to be furniture scattered around, um, different obstacles, and you're going to have to find that with your gloves on. Can't take your gloves off. And you're going to have to put the, the nut on the bolt. And so you go through and you, you know, you're sweeping the floor with your body and you're, you're like worried, am I going to hit this thing and just knock it? And of course that happens. And, uh, and you, but, but sure enough, somehow all the training that they, that they give you, you, you find this nut somewhere hidden in a room, it might be out in the middle of a room. Um, and, and you, and you, you get to the bottom, you find the bolt, and you put them together, and you, and you pass the test. And you do lots of crazy things like that, wild things like that, not to mention the stuff that they're teaching you out of books and, and that type of thing, tests that you have to take. And at the end of it all, you wonder, is this really going to work? Like, if once I actually go into a burning building, am I actually going to know what to do, Right? And then sure enough, uh, you go on your first call, you go into a, a fire, and somehow all the stuff they put in you comes out. It's an amazing experience. It's like all of a sudden the training starts to make sense. Oh, this is why we did this, and this is why we did that. And the training works. It, it, ha it produces the intended result. Today we're going to be considering it similarly the way that God's Word does that. The way that the Word of God works in you, works inside of you, if you receive it the way that you should receive it. And we'll talk about that. And, and then as you're going about your life, you find it just, it's working. It's just coming out. You're, you're different than you were. Um, because of what God's Word is doing. Everybody ready for us to dive in this morning? We're, um, we're talking about being living on mission, and um, I've done a couple of sermons on that, and this is our final sermon on that. We talked about the importance of an, an identity that is rooted in an understanding of God's incredible love for us, that, that he made you uniquely, he loves you uniquely, he likes what he made, he, he, has, he has purposes for you, things that he wants you specifically to do that no one else can that will bring him glory. And, and then um, last week we talked about what it looks like to actually talk to people about our faith, to actually talk to people about what we believe about Jesus. How do we go about that practically? And, and the ways, and, and we talked a little bit about how we overcomplicate that sometimes. We get ourselves worked up. We get, we get a little scared about it, but that it doesn't have to be that way. Um, today, we're, we're wrapping this up by, by looking at the fact that um, neither one of those, neither of those first two sermons are possible uh, without this. You can't you can't have a Christ-centered, secure identity, and you can't go out and live on mission in such a way that you're going to glorify God and bear fruit if the Word of God isn't in you. 
It's not, if, if it's not dwelling in you, if, if God's word isn't richly dwelling in you, you won't be able to do those things. So that's, that's where this is all headed um, and, uh, and what we're going to be considering today. I want to start out by, uh, by talking about the kingdom of God. Uh, maybe you've heard talk about the kingdom of God and wondered what that's about. Um, the if you've read the Gospels, you find that Jesus talks about it quite a lot. Uh, in fact, in the four Gospels in the ESV, the word kingdom comes up 126 times. So if you don't have a, a little bit of a grasp on what this idea of kingdom is, then you're going to be missing out on a lot, maybe confused by some things. So I want to start there, just briefly considering what is the kingdom of God? Because Jesus' preaching is summarized um, by Matthew and Mark by saying essentially that when he went out preaching, he, he, he would preach, repent for the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, those are interchangeable, is at hand um, or it's, it's within grasp, it's, it's near is what he's saying. The kingdom of God is near to you, so turn toward God. That's, that's the way that Jesus preached. And then also, if you've been around church a little bit, you probably know that he taught uh, his disciples, and, and therefore us, he taught us to pray, uh, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is a, something that we're supposed to be praying. We're praying for his kingdom to come. So what's this kingdom? Well, um, the kingdom of God is the rule and reign of God. Pretty simple. It's the rule and the reign of God. And um, one day, Jesus is going to physically return, the Bible says. He's going he's to come, and he is going to conquer, and he is going to set up his kingdom in this place, on a new heavens, a new earth. Um, he is going to physically set up his kingdom. You will see it. That day is coming. That's... Theologians refer to that as the, king, the consummation of the kingdom. And so in that sense, the kingdom is not yet, right? But in the sense that wherever people willingly give their allegiance to the king, in that sense, the kingdom is already here. And anywhere and everywhere, thank you, Eric. I, I like, get it, get it, get it. Give some feedback every now and then. It's not a bad thing. I'm wondering if you guys are awake. Um, wherever someone submits their lives to the kingdom of God, the kingdom is there. That submits to the king of this kingdom, then the kingdom is, is there. And so right now, the kingdom of God is not a physical kingdom that we can see, but it's hidden. And, and we see this a lot in Jesus' parables. He, he talks about how the kingdom is, um, because it's advancing within the hearts of people, and growing within the hearts of people, the kingdom is sort of like leaven that's in a lump of dough. But the interesting thing about leaven is it doesn't go into a lump of dough without spreading and transforming it, does it? Right? He also talks about the kingdom being hidden like a seed underneath the ground. And don't see it, but something's happening underneath the ground, right? And so we know that um, the kingdom is coming wherever we see the effects of it. And wherever we see um, the undoing of the power and effects of sin, the kingdom has come. The kingdom brings liberation from the enslaving domain of darkness. It produces works of righteousness like light in this world. When the kingdom comes, sickness is healed. Demons are dethroned. Sin is put to death as lies are exposed and the truth is believed. We see the kingdom coming wherever disciples are made. And... Jesus is embraced as Lord. 
So God's kingdom advances as his rule, his kingship advances in hearts and lives. So we could say that God's mission is to further the lordship of Christ on the earth. You following me with that? But how does this happen? That's what I want to get at today. But how? How does that happen? And throughout history, people have been confused about this, about how God's kingdom comes. And it does not come through um, political systems or through earthly means of power. That's the mistake that humanity has made many times over. It's not how it comes. Maybe you're familiar with the time where Jesus is standing before Pontius Pilate, king of the universe, talking to a little king. And what does he, he sa- say to him? He says to him, my kingdom is not of this world. His kingdom is a kingdom that spreads through hearts and lives. Wherever people are brought more under his rule, where his will is done on earth just like it's always done in heaven, his kingdom has come. But how does that happen? That's what the sermon is about. And, and, and so if you're a note taker, um, I don't want to disappoint. I got you a couple points. The first is this. The word does the work. The word does does the work. And this is not to say that the Holy Spirit is not intimately involved. Um, The Holy Spirit wields the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And so this is, uh, the focus today isn't on the power of the Spirit, though this is, the power of the Spirit is absolutely necessary. But what does the Spirit use? in advancing the kingdom, in transforming lives, in setting captives free. The word does the work. So, so this week, I want, this is what I want you to be thinking about as you leave here today. The thing that I want you to marinate on, the thing that when you're doing dishes on Tuesday night or you're changing a baby's diaper on Wednesday morning or you're sitting in a meeting on Friday at work, wherever you find yourself this week, I want you to be thinking, how does the kingdom of God come? How does the kingdom of, of God advance? And the answer is simple. The word does the work. The word does the work. Let's look at this passage that we read in 1 Thessalonians 2.13 again. Um, we also thank God constantly for this that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. Now, how is it? I mean, it's been a, it's been a while since Paul had been in Thessalonica, since he had preached the word to these believers. And, and So how is it that he can say that even though he hasn't been there and it's been some time, that the word is still at work in them? How does that work out? How how does that make sense? And the answer is that the word does the work of advancing the kingdom because it is the seed of the kingdom. God's word is the seed of the kingdom. This is what Paul is getting at um, in 1 Corinthians 3, 6, where he says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. What did Paul plant? The seed of the word. What did Apollos water? The seed of the word. What did God cause to grow? The seed of the word. Wherever the word of God is planted into good soil, and we'll talk about what that means in just a minute. Um, Wherever it is watered, wherever enough time is given, the kingdom grows. God's word is the seed of the kingdom. I want us to think about that for just a little bit. 
um, I brought an acorn um, from my yard. This is an oak tree seed. Seeds are, are an incredible thing to, to just ponder. Um, I have these massive oaks in my backyard that must be a couple hundred years old. Massive oaks. And sometimes um, I'll be in the backyard trying to gather up these, these acorns um, and I'll just stop and look at one of these things and then look up at this massive oak and think, how is it that inside one of these little guys is everything that is needed, given a little bit of starlight and some water, that everything that's needed to become that is, is in here? You ever think about that? Let me show you a picture. So, so this is um, the Seven Sisters Oak. It's a famous oak tree, one of the oldest oak trees, they, they think, in America, at least. And they estimate that this tree is between 600 and 1,000 years old. Um, it's, uh, I think it's in Louisiana. Um, it's amazing to think about that that tree that that tree started with one of these. One. And um, as, as unimpressive as this is, as, as unassuming as it is, latent in every se- single one of these seeds is the potential for that. A, a tree that um, is able to weather droughts, storms, high winds, harsh winters, uh, for centuries. It's wild. The point is that seeds are laden with life and packed with potential. And so it is with the Word of God. So it is with the Word of God. And, and what that means is that every single time You read this every single time. Every single time you hear a sermon. Every single time there is within it, within God's powerful living word, the potential for life transformation, for freedom from sin. There is the potential for new life in your life every single time you hear the word. It's an incredible thing to think about. Jesus said in John 6, 63, my words are spirit and life. This thing's alive. The primary way that the kingdom of God advances is through the preaching of the gospel, the good news, right? The good news about Jesus Christ. If you're new to all of this, what what does that mean? Well, the Bible says that the problem with the world, the reason that the world is as broken as it is, the reason that we, if we're honest with ourselves, are as broken as we are, is because of what the Bible calls sin, a rebellion against the creator, a rebellion against the one who made this whole world, designed the whole thing, and keeps it all running, including keeps our hearts beating. Sin is the willful rebellion against him. Whether we acknowledge that or not, we choose to ignore him, we choose to push him away, we choose to not think about him. That's where sin begins. And that sin breaks us. It's, it's against our design. It's against the design of his whole creation. And therefore, it separates us from the one who gave us life and sustains us with life. But the good news, the gospel, is that he's done something about it. The good news is that 
He did something about our sin so that he could restore us, redeem us, bring us back into relationship with himself. And what he did was that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to take on the form of a human being, to live this life perfectly, sinlessly, to then go to a sinner's death, to go to the cross, and to die the death that we deserve because of our sin. In other words, he, he took our place. He swapped places with us. And he said, I will be treated the way that your sin deserves so that you can be treated the way that I deserve. That's the good news. But it goes further. The, the good news says that when he died, he didn't stay dead. You can't keep the giver of life dead and on the third day he rose from the dead he walked out of the grave and and he declared that anyone who would turn to him in faith and believe that he is indeed the son of god and that he did die for sins and that he did raise from the dead that anyone who believes that and then in response to that belief turns to him and says yeah you are lord you are king and I give you my allegiance. Yeah. That, that you'll be saved. It's the way that we talk about it. Saved from the effects and the damnation that our sin brought on. Rescued from that. Rescued from that separation from the life giver. Restored back. And now you're able to live the way that you were designed to live. Another way the Bible talks about it is it's like you're, the blinders are being taken off and all of a sudden you can see. You see yourself rightly, you see the world rightly, you see God rightly. And it's the knowledge of God, it's coming into a relationship with your creator that is eternal life. What, what Jesus said, this is eternal life, that they know you and your son whom you sent. Eternal life, the thing that brings you ultimate satisfaction, the only thing that can bring you soul-deep satisfaction is a relationship with the one who made you. And we search for it everywhere in a million different ways. But there's only one thing that can satisfy. And he provided for that satisfaction through his son. So if you haven't believed... If you haven't turned to him and believed in him and trusted him and said, okay, yet you are king. I would invite you today to become new, to be set free and to, to have the blinders taken off by turning to Jesus and putting your trust in him. Anytime that we do that, um, that is, that, that word that I just described, the gospel, that good news is coming into our lives and it is doing the work and giving us new life. Paul puts it this way, Romans 1.16, the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. The gospel, the word, the good news is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. It's a seed. 1 Peter 1, 23, Peter puts it this way. You have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. There it is. The word of God is a seed that comes into our hearts and begins to grow and change things and transform us. But that's not the only time that the word has landed in your life if you're a Christian. Um, that's not the only time the seed of the word has landed in your heart and unleashed its power. If there is anything new about you since you have become a Christian, if there is any transformation, 
if you've experienced any freedom from sin, if you have had any kind of a right perspective because you believed in him, any joy in genuine worship, any good fruit that's come from your life, it is because of the word of God. It landed in your heart and it did the work. And every single time you hear it, it has that potential to release the power of God in your life. This is what Jesus is getting at in Mark 4, 26 through 29. He says, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. This is how the kingdom of God works. The seed gets scattered. And we don't know how it happened, but change starts to happen. In our lives, in our families, in our workplaces, wherever the seed gets scattered, transformation happens. New life happens happens. God's power happens. Like a seed, God's word is latent with life and packed with the power of the kingdom. Within it, all that is needed for growth and full healthy life is contained. So, if the word does the work, here's the question for us. Why don't we all look like spiritual versions of the Seven Sisters Oak? (laughs) And the answer is because, um, like any seed, God's word must have the right environment and time to grow. And that's what I want to look at next. My second point is this. Learn it, love it, live it out. And I get this from um, 1 Thessalonians 3.13. I want to look at that again. The first thing that we need to do if God's word can do the work or will do the work is that we need to learn it. Um, If you look at the passage, 1 Thessalonians 2.13, he says that they accepted it, or sorry, he says that they received the word of God, right? They they received it. And, and, And so, here is what he means by that. You learned it. Um, scripture that you don't understand can't do you any good. You, you, can't, you can't be transformed by the word of God that you don't understand. Scripture that you don't remember can't do you any good. This is also part of the Holy Spirit's work because the Holy Spirit reminds us of the things that he's taught us. But but in order for the scriptures to, to land in the kind of soil that, that it needs so that, that it can do its work, it, we've got to learn it. So this is the first step. You need to learn God's word. You need to understand it. You need to remember it. You need to store it up in your heart so that you, can't, so that you don't sin against God. So whatever it takes to learn the word, do it. And I'll just give you a hint. Learning requires some study. And, and, and some of the times we, um, we push back with, well, I'm not, I'm not an academic. I'm not a book person. I don't. But here's the reality. You study things. You do. Everybody does. You get into something. You get into a new hobby or, or something, and you study. I promise. You, you just, we all do it. And so, with the same kind of passion that you study a hobby or, or a new project or something that you suddenly are captivated by, take that same passion and pursue learning God's Word. It's the first step if you want it to transform you. Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, 7, think over what I say. There's work implied there. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. 
it's a partnership. There's work that you need to do, but God ultimately is the one who will give you understanding. So it must be learned. Secondly, it must be loved. Paul says to the Thessalonians, he says, you accepted it as what it really is, the word of God. Paul is saying that they looked past the unassuming seed and saw that embedded in the word was the DNA for transformation. Why is the word of God so transformative, so powerful? Why should we love it? And the answer is because through the Bible, God has revealed himself to us. The creator, the one who made you and designed you, is revealing himself to you primarily through his word. He reveals himself to you through uh, nature. The Bible says that we can see his, some of his attributes through the created world, right? But there is nothing that is more clearly revealing to us who God is than his word. And so we should love it. We should, we should accept this for what this is, the very word of God, him speaking to us. In him we live and move and have our being. Do you realize that the entire universe is somehow like inside God? He is so big. He is so massive. And he stoops down. Um, and he reveals himself to us through his word, primarily through the, the word made flesh, Jesus Christ. But how do you get to know Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, you got to open your Bible. You got to read about Him. You got to study Him and get to know Him. Love God's Word by seeing it for what it is. Like the psalmist in Psalm 119, 97, we should declare, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Thirdly, it must be lived out. He says, he says that this word is at work in them, which is at work in you believers. Now, I would argue the only reason that he can say that is because they're actually putting it into practice. Right? They're living it out. James warns that anytime we hear God's word but fail to put it into practice, we actually are deceiving ourselves. And so if it's been a long time since you've made any kind of change based upon what God's word says, then do some soul searching because it just may be that you've become deceived by hearing the word over and over and over without putting any of it into practice. Uh, we must live out what we learn. So take time to ask God God to, to show you your, your own blind spots. Take time to, to do the work of combing through your life. If you're doing this 21 days of prayer and fasting, this is a perfect opportunity to take the time to, to say, God, show me where is it in my life that I know what your word says and I'm not doing it. Am I, am I living generously the way that God says to live generously? Am I loving others? Am I, am I others-oriented or am I self-focused and turn inward? Am I putting sin to death where I see it in my life? Where is that word that I know it, but I'm ignoring it? And I have for so long that I don't even see it anymore. And he'll show you. Wherever God's word is learned, loved, and lived out, God's life-giving power is released and his kingdom grows because the word does the work. So in addition to learning it and loving it and living it out, what else can we do? And that brings me to my third final point. And the third point is keep sowing seed. Keep sowing seed. My hope um, is that after this series about living on mission, you're, you're going to be stirred up to get out there and, and spread the gospel, to share 
testimonies of what God's done in your life or is doing in your life, that you're going to be intentional about your conversations. That's my hope. My hope is that we would get we would stop being turned inward and we would turn outward and we would see the world around us that needs the hope of the gospel. And that you would spread the seed of the gospel everywhere you can. But you will never do that if you aren't first sowing it in your own life. So don't neglect sowing in your own life. And let me just address something here. Maybe you haven't desired the word, and that's the problem. You haven't wanted it. Well, guess what? You know, you know how to start wanting the word? You've got to take it in. Here is what Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 15, 16. Your words were found, and I ate them, and your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart. It does not say, your word was the joy and the delight of my heart, and then I decided I'll take that in. I'll eat that. He says, I ate them. And then they became my delight. If you don't desire the word, the, the way forward is to begin to feed on the word. Um, because as you receive the seed of the word, it will do the work of transformation in you. I want to just encourage you that whatever current level of intake you're practicing of God's word daily, weekly, that you would take these next three weeks and along with this time of prayer and fasting that you would accept the challenge to turn it up a little bit, to take whatever level of current intake that you have of God's word and add to it and just test it for three weeks and see if it doesn't produce fruit in your life. I have heard it said that we don't need to learn more of the Bible until we first learn to live out everything that we've already learned. And that might sound good on the surface because of what I've already talked about, about the importance of um, living it out, right? But the problem is that it's, it's misled because um, the, the Bible also says that we need constantly to be renewed in our minds, that we need constantly to set our minds on the things of the Spirit in order to walk by the Spirit, that we need constantly to set our minds on the things above, not on things on this earth. And you can't do any of that if you're not taking the Word in regularly and feeding on it. So wherever you are right now, if you're having a quiet time, um, in the mornings, daily you're having a quiet time, or in the evenings, or whenever you do that, whatever that looks like for you, your current level, turn it up. I have a few suggestions. I've been trying to do this myself for the last few weeks. A um, couple of things that I've been trying, and, and anything works. Um, but at night, um, my wife and I, we try to pray before we go to sleep, and I'll just reach over and grab the Bible, and I'll just read five or six verses, a little bit of a proverb, a little bit of a psalm. I don't, I don't preach a sermon. She wouldn't let me do that. But I just read a little passage, and then we pray. And, here, and here's, what, here's what you find. Sometimes that, a seed lands in your heart you didn't know, and I wake up in the morning, and a verse is on my mind. It's like, where did that come from? Oh, yeah, I read that last night. Or it comes up later in the day. Oh, yeah, I read that. Another thing I've been trying is um, the Bible on audio. Some of you are aware of this. Some of you, this is going to blow your mind. <laughs> you can have someone else read the Bible to you if you have a smartphone any time you want. You can download, um, you can download it on podcasts, audio Bible. You can, you can download the ESV app, and it has the audio. You can download the Bible app, and it has different translations that can be read to you. You can have someone reading the word to you anytime. Do you know what ancient people would have given <laughs> to have that gift? And so maybe for you, it's like, okay, whenever I'm in the car, I'm just going to listen to the Bible on audio. Or maybe it's whenever I'm cooking dinner, I'm just going to listen to the Bible 
on audio. If you're a musical person, here's another suggestion. You can sing scripture. There are some wonderful resources out there where people have taken pure scripture and put it to song in, in awesome ways. If you have little kids and you haven't discovered slugs and bugs, check it out. It's awesome. So we did a lot of slugs and bugs when our kids were really little. I kind of forgot about it. Recently, in this attempt to get more of the word in my heart, I've been listening to slugs and bugs. <laughs> no, no joke, by myself, the other day I was riding down the, the road, and I was like, I want the word. I just want the word in my heart. And I pulled up slugs and bugs, and I listened to a song about not worrying. I'm not going to start singing it. But. <laughs> um. So check that out. Or um, maybe that's not your thing. Uh, there's another one for families called Seeds Family Worship. Or maybe you are an empty nester. You don't have kids or you just don't want to do the whole kid thing. Uh, there's some really amazing worship out there called Corner Room. And it's the same thing. It's just, it's scripture put to song. And you find that it gets stuck in your head. And you're just singing truth. You're singing seeds. <laughs> it's amazing. I believe that if we want to be a people who live on mission, that begins with being a people who are saturated with the word of God. Because the word does the work. The path to a fruitful life on mission is paved with pages from your Bible. The word does the work. So learn it, love it, and live it out, and you'll find your delight in God increasing, your passion for his name increasing your burden for those around you that don't know him yet increasing and your life radiating with the very life of Jesus let's pray together Lord thank you for this simple yet profound truth that you have given us what we need to live transformed lives, but also to change the world around us. Uh, to see your kingdom come and your will be done more in our lives and more in the lives of those in our home, in our workplace, wherever we can scatter the seed. The word does the work. I pray, God, that we would scatter more seed in our own lives for these next three weeks and that we would be convinced that this is good, that we need your word. Honor your word, Lord. Don't let it return to you void. Do work in us, transforming us, setting us free, empowering us to, be, to live lives on mission for the glory of King Jesus, in his name.